Never carry your phone in your pocket or in your bra. Never use your laptop on your lap. Never hold a phone up to your head to make a call. Always use speakerphone or a wired headset. Welcome to Exploring Mind and Body with Drew Tadia. Drew is an expert in nutrition, fitness, lifestyle, and more. And he wants to help you live a healthier, longer, and more active life. Now here's your host, Drew Tadia. Welcome to another edition of Nationally Syndicated Exploring Mind and Body. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for tuning in and being a part of our True Form Life community. We're coming at you with a brand new show. We appreciate whether you're listening on terrestrial radio across the country or as a podcast around the world. We certainly wouldn't be here without you. So stick around. We got all that coming up. This is Exploring Mind and Body. Naturally improve your lifestyle one show at a time with your host, Drew Tadia. Uh, we, we live in a small beach town, um, uh, about a mile from, from the beach and, uh, it's, it's really, really nice. The, um, all the beaches, these are kind of the nicest beaches in Panama in this area. And you can go and be like the only people on the whole beach and just spend the day and relax. And so, uh, but we live in a, a kind of a, an expat town. So has things like fast internet and good, sh- uh, supermarkets and, um, uh, even a hospital. So it has a lot of the stuff that you, you kind of need for a comfortable life, but it's still a small town and, and, uh, in a pretty remote part of Panama. Sounds miserable. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Living on the beach with some good internet and hospitals. I mean, I wouldn't want that. <laughs> no, I know it's rough. It's rough. It's truly rough. How did you get there? <laughs> Uh, we were actually stranded here during COVID and decided instead of kind of negotiating our way back to the States that uh, we would just get our residency and get a house and <laughs> chill out. So, <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Another horrible thing to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Victim of COVID, just like so many others. So you were there visiting? <laughs> Yeah, we were planning. A, this was the first. Panama was the first stop on an extended tour around Latin America, and um, so our next stop was Colombia, and um, we still haven't made it to Colombia. <laughs> so we're <laughs> two, two, uh Actually, yeah, as of yesterday, it's two years. So was it difficult for you to get residency? No, it's super easy uh, for Americans and Canadians to. Um, uh, to get residency here. It's it's like the easiest country in the world. Do you have uh, an extra get, room? Uh, we have a plan to put up a casita in the back. That'll become my office. And so this can resume its its function as the guest room. Nice. So you do have an extra room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's all I got out of that. Yeah. <laughs> it, does, it does actually. I, we did put it in when we took out the bed. We put it in a sofa bed. Uh, yeah. Like one of those ca- convertible couches. So technically we can, we can accommodate a guest. I, I, I wouldn't recommend the comfort level of that bad, but I guess it depends on how badly you want to see Panama. <laughs> I don't want to see Panama. I want to live in Panama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had, a, I played baseball in university and I, uh, played with a couple of guys from Panama. Oh, okay. And it's super nice guys. If that represents the culture. Yeah. But, it's uh, a very friendly culture. Very chill and friendly. Yeah. It's hot there uh yeah yeah but you know i came my last stop before here was vegas so you know (laughs) it depends what you want to compare it to (laughs) is that where you lived uh yeah for five years nice and you're like hey let's go for a trip around the world and got stuck in panama yep that's exactly yeah you got it hey why didn't that happen to me yeah (laughs) (laughs) did did you try no i didn't try well there that's the first step that's the first step (laughs) well you know it's crazy i was actually in la we have a also have a place in la and right now i'm in alberta canada Mm -hmm. and my wife was here in canada when COVID hit and they're talking about closing the board the canadian u.s borders and then the growth at first i was like thought it was like kind of a joke and that and then the grocery stores were empty and then that's when it first hit me i was like because we have a, a smaller apartment there's just a, a studio apartment one bedroom and um 
we don't you don't have big like in canada we have basements and deep freezes and you could survive in la if you don't have food (laughs) yeah (laughs) for a week you can't really survive (laughs) so that was when it first hit me all the grocery stores were empty and people were going a little bit crazy and then i was separated from my wife and and most of my family's up here anyway so i ended up jumping on a plane it was almost the overnight thing it was i think if i remember correct it was like a thursday wednesday thursday when things started to hit the fan and then it was grocery stores were completely empty for the, on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday. And then Monday, they're, they're Sunday, Monday, they're saying we're closing the flight. We're, we're talking about closing the borders. And then you don't know how long you might be stuck for. So I think it was Monday or Tuesday morning. I jumped on a plane and came back. Here. back. Yeah. Yeah. But that's it, the same sort of decision process we went through, except the United States didn't look that compelling a destination for us at that at that time. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> where in LA is your is your pad? Redondo Beach, LA. Oh, very nice. I yeah. lived in Venice for ten years. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. We're, na- we're almost neighbors. Yeah, <laughs> very similar. If you just if you just for time, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. In traffic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we actually. So this one time we were gonna take a bus to Venice, and it was about an hour bus ride. Like we sit on the bus for an hour. So then we looked it we looked it up to ride a bike. <laughs> and yeah. it was about an hour to ride a bike. <laughs> so we're like, <laughs> why would we sit on a bus for an hour if we could just cruise down the coast for an hour? It seemed like a no brainer. Yeah. No, it's it's gorgeous. So oh yeah, so you're in so you're in Panama. And then is that are you like missing home or wish you can get back or No, not at all. No. And uh, so we we planned for a, a an extended trip. Um and uh so we uh you know gave up our our you know we sold our cars, we put everything into storage. Um and so like there's we don't have a, any rent or anything that we're just double paying or anything like that. So um it, we were just kind of set up to be stranded, I guess. <laughs> it was meant to be yeah <laughs> so what is it like i i don't even know what i, I was in sri lanka <laughs> i kind of picture tropical kind of people or people selling fruit on the side of the street is it tro- yeah it depends on the town but yeah i mean so here not so much um there is a uh there's one store where you can get fresh farm produce uh twice a week um but um no it's more it's it's I don't know how to describe it. It's a very picturesque little Pueblo. Um, the uh, the um, first female president of Panama. So she was president from, I think, 2000 to 2005. She was from this town. And so when she was president, uh, she directed, I think, a lot of investment here as a so until 2004, this town wasn't even connected by pavement to the rest of Panama there. Um, it was dirt, dirt, gravel roads. So she directed investment here. And so they, it's just this adorable little town. It only it's a population of, I think, 2,500. And about 20% of that is expats. So it has like these cute little uh, homes and little stores. There's a town square um, and um, uh, a few small. They, I mean, they're not technically supermarkets. They call them mini supers, but you can get a lot of what you need here in this town. And uh, um, the one thing you can get the way that you're you're thinking of is fish, because this is a big fishing area. So you can go down to the beach every day when the fishermen come in and uh, and and buy some fresh fish. Oh, nice. Yeah. Do you guys do that? Uh, yeah. This, but our, our favorite isn't isn't. Um, there's some issue with it right now, so we can't because uh, this is the tuna coast of panama and um but no one seems to be catching any tuna right now so uh, but we get a lot of uh shrimp and octopus and mahi i think i had some mahi when i was in hawaii i don't remember it's good it's good fish yeah yeah well fresh fish of any kind is good fish in my opinion yeah well (laughs) when we were in sri lanka we actually were walking down the beach and they had these restaurants on the beach And then they would have, when you're walking, they'd have tables set up with fish from a bucket. I don't know. They must, I'm guessing they fished it. Then they put the fish in the bucket. And then from the bucket, they lay it on ice. 
So it's right from the ocean. You're walking by, and then they say, "Which fish do you want? We'll cook it at this restaurant." And That's like, great. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, love, I love that kind of thing. Yeah. Here again, the big thing that that keeps getting me every time, because um, we were just at the beach on Sunday two days ago, is you can just go to these beaches and they're so gorgeous, and you can basically be alone. Um, it's just, so, it's so amazing to me that there's these gorgeous, gorgeous beaches and they're not crowded. Um, and, and, and not just not crowded, they're almost unpopulated and it's, it's just fantastic way to experience it. A little different than the LA beaches. Yeah. Just <laughs> un poquito, un poquito. Yeah. <laughs> so what did I want to ask you about that? Oh, I want to ask you about the trash. Because in Sri Lanka, the trash was atrocious. I was shocked. Oh, no, here, yeah, here it's fine. I mean, we have trash pickup uh, once a week, and um, uh, I I heard that this town did have a bit of a trash problem until a few years ago. And the mayor, he's one of these young, dynamic mayors, and he did some kind of social pressure stunt um, to really kind of peer pressure everybody into cleaning up, and they have. Um, and then we get some trash washing up, like, especially if there's a big earthquake in the, in the Pacific or even in, in Asia, um, it can lead to a lot of trash washing up on our shores. And so when that happens, they do community cleanups on the beaches too. So the beaches are super clean and the town is really clean and trash. The infrastructure here is very, uh, it's conducive to a Western lifestyle. Nice. So you said expat is that uh, is that expat? Saying? Uh, yeah, expatriate. So someone like Americans and Canadians and Europeans who come live here. Those are we're called expats. Okay, and is that welcome there? Yeah, the locals are happy to have you there. Or don't yeah. really want you there. Yeah, which to me is still a shock because it was only thirty years ago that the United States invaded this country and deposed its leadership. Um, but they still. Uh, they're, they're very welcoming to, to, um, to expats and the economic infusions that are, they, that we represent. So you guys don't have any plans of going anywhere? Uh, we would like to resume our trip to, uh, Colombia, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, we don't, we don't, we don't, um, have fixed plans yet. Our, our flight credit, I think expires in July. So, you know, from when they were canceled for COVID. So I think we have until July, if we want to make use of the, uh, what we are, the tickets we already paid for, but, um, no, not in a, not in a particular rush. I, you know, like we, we both work. So, uh, and we're both getting a lot of work done these days. So it's not like we're retired, unfortunately. <laughs> right. Uh, we still have, you know, jobs. So, <laughs> well, that's the same as when I'm in LA, like people think, and I spent half the year there. <laughs> so, but people still, when I'm in LA, people see pictures, they still think I'm on vacation. I work <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, I, the yeah, LA picture. Yeah. LA, LA also feels a little bit like you're on vacation, even when you're not. Right. So you guys are, so you started your business before you got there. Yeah. I, well, I started the business in 2012. So I, when I started the business, I actually had another business. Um, so I started uh, SYB as a part-time uh, sort of a, as an experiment, as a, uh, I don't know if hobby is the right word, but, you know, I'd been in software development for about 20 years and I'd really um, been interested in uh, other, other types of work. Um, and I'd been surrounded by tech and and uh, high tech and and software and software experiences particularly in the LA side of of the tech industry where it's uh, you know entertainment focused and uh there I I enjoyed aspects of it um but at the same time I felt I'm trying to think this is the first time I've spoken about it in these terms so I felt like technology was demanding a lot of people and um, through connectivity, and I mean, and issues we're starting to see more and more and more today. Um, but I was feeling this, you know, back back in uh, 12 years ago, and you know, even people just not being willing to turn off their phone for the night for while you're out on a date or for the weekend or whatever, it is, and just these these constant pressures. And so uh, I, that's when when I started working on the overpowered book with my father, um, 
and I got more into the EMF issue, I saw an opportunity to to do something that I thought, you know, would be good and helpful for people and also a little bit more fulfilling for myself personally. So I started it, uh, like I say, part time in 2012. That was when I, I uh, helped my father write Overpowered, released the first product in 2013. And then it was three years later that I sold uh, my half of the software company and to my partner and went full time with SYB. So I've been doing SYB full time, uh, well, part time for 10 years, full time for six years. And so, yes, I started it um, uh, from Vegas. I mean, I started the full, I started the company part time from LA, but by the, by the time I went full time, I was in Vegas. So what you got tired of California taxes and you moved to Vegas or what? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, the, it, <laughs> uh, it, it Vegas off. Well, no, I mean, I moved around in between LA and Vegas and there were just, uh, some professional reasons why Las Vegas made sense at the time. And it never, it wasn't the place that I, it wasn't a place where I ever thought I saw myself ever living. Um, but once I started living there, you start to realize like everyone's impression of Vegas is based on the strip. But <laughs> when you live in Vegas, you never go to the strip unless you have friends coming in from out of town. Um, and that is one of the benefits of Vegas is when you live in Vegas, so many of your friends come through town like once a year, once every couple of years. So you get to see a lot of people. Uh, but it, it really, other than the, uh, summer heat, uh, which, which can get intense. It really is a very nice place to live. Um, and I, I feel like in the, uh, you know, in the pandemic, more and more people have discovered that. So the, uh, I don't know, I don't know exactly where rents and home values are. I know they've gone up a tremendous amount, uh, but that's because so many people started moving, moving from particularly from California into Vegas, because it's just, it really is. It has great entertainment. It has great restaurants. It has, or at least it, when I lived there had like essentially no traffic. I think I was in three traffic jams in the in, you know, five years that I lived there. Um, and, uh, it, it just had a lot of compelling advantages. Um, so that's, that's the Vegas story, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not there right now. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend that lived in Vegas and she said the same thing that you don't like, you don't go to the strip if you live yeah. in Vegas, <laughs> but then yeah. at the same time, I feel like it's a, it might be a challenging place because everyone wants to go party and, in Vegas and you're like, I have a job and I live here. <laughs> yeah. The people who live there don't go partying all the time. Again, unless right. you have friends coming into town. So that's really when you focus your partying is, is when your friends are coming into town and getting crazy. <laughs> yeah. So then, so when did the, so, so let's take a, let's get closer to what you do as a profession. So you started sure. <laughs> doing that more full time in, in Vegas and yeah. And then, so how did that progress into a, a full-time gig? Well, so, um, I mean, the, it, it progressed starting, like I say, I launched the first product in 2013, launched a few more products, you know, 2014, 2015, and I saw market potential. And I realized if I was, if I was going to be able to realize that potential, I really needed to give it my all. I also realized where i knew this going in but really started to hit home you know doing syb is a fundamentally different skill set than uh the software development that i done i mean obviously analytical thinking and running a business uh can you know those are those are kind of portable skills uh but i didn't know when i started syb i didn't know how to do product design, product development. I didn't know supply chain management. I didn't know mm -hmm. direct to consumer marketing. Uh, there were basically nothing, <laughs> nothing that I did at SYB uh, involved skills that I, I'd mastered in the prior 20 years, uh, except for, for education, because uh, SYB does a lot of education uh, through articles and webinars and videos. And I'd done a lot of education previously. Uh, so, but again, with a few exceptions, I didn't really have the skill set, the proper skill set to do SYB when I started SYB. So switching to full time gave me the ability 
to 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 focus on it and to focus on growing my my skills that would be required to grow it into the future. You know, it's funny is I think that selling is such an important aspect in life. Like we're always selling. Doesn't matter yeah. what it is. And you don't really realize that until you get into sales. <laughs> you know what I mean? I we have these I had these conversations, a couple of brief conversations online for a couple of used things. Like there's a we're looking for an extra fridge or second fridge for the basement. Um and then I found I just bought a snowmobile. <laughs> <laughs> I said, if I'm gonna be here all winter, I'm gonna enjoy it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you run into so many people that don't they don't have a they don't know how to communicate properly i feel like you get one word answers you get thumbs up i feel like people don't know how to have a like a polite conversation it's almost like if you're trying to sell something they they feel like you're or trying to buy something one side or both sides feels like they're one of them is trying to take advantage of you mm -hmm. like it's it's a really odd dynamic and those of us that are in sales, like as an entrepreneur, you have to, once you learn how to develop a product, you have to learn how to sell it, mm -hmm. which takes up quite, quite some time. So that's something that we do on a regular basis. But then you have these conversations with people that might be one off selling a product or just trying to get rid of a snowmobile or a <laughs> fridge. And the conversations I've had are, they're just so odd. I'm, and I'm just like, what what's wrong with you? Why why do you think the world is <laughs> out to get you? And why can't you be a polite human being? <laughs> I think yeah, what you just said. Well, it it, it touches on what I was talking about, and uh, but separate from that, I feel like it touches on something that you know I think a lot of people are seeing, which is uh, people are just increasingly weird. Uh, they are increasingly on edge. They are increasingly anxious, and you see it in any number of different interactions. Uh, I don't know. I, mean, I my 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 uh, intuition is that Canada is probably not quite as extreme as the United States on this, but is likely headed in the you know kind of the same direction. So I don't know what you'd say. Seventy percent of the issues that I'm talking about in the U.S. are probably present in Canada. Hundred percent. But yep. yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, obviously the pandemic had a lot to do with it. Um, I also happen to believe that our relationship with technology is a big part of it. And also what the, the big tech platforms, um, how they are, uh, let's say managing the communication on their platforms is a part of it. And, and so I see that not just in, in sales interactions. Um, I see it in just dealing with people. People are more on edge. They are more anxious. And, and like I said, I mean, the pandemic is more or less kind of coming to an end. Not that the, not that the virus has gone anywhere, but I think people are over the kind of the lockdown mentality, the quarantine mentality that it's not a hundred percent over, but that's ending. And so the, the ripple effects through the economy, you know, the, they'll get weaker and weaker over time, I think is what we're seeing. Um, but the, so th to the extent that that's responsible for this, you know, I think that'll diminish, but I don't, uh, a lot of what has happened in the past couple of years um, and what was happening before that building up to it, that isn't going away. And that is one of the things that, that I, uh, I mean, I, just, just having a better relationship with your technology and maybe having a bit more regulation on companies like Facebook and Google, that is, that, that won't solve all of it, but that would, I think, help start moving things in the right direction. Um, I don't know if I expressed that. In, in clear terms. But I really do think that because the pandemic really, A, it, it exacerbated social tension, but it, it exacerbated our personal relationship with technology because we all had to use tech so much more for basically every aspect of our job that you couldn't go into work for, or you couldn't go to the supermarket, so you ordered it online, or you couldn't go to the mall, so you ordered it off of Am and and your your kids couldn't go to daycare, so you stuck them in front of an iPad, and all of all of these uh, things, you know, because they're, they're I'm not just talking about my gut here. There there is there is growing body of science showing that 
our relationship with technology. Um, and, and you know from our past conversation, I focus a lot on EMF, but here I'm talking about separate from EMF. Our relationship with technology creates depression. It negatively impacts cognition, negatively impacts our ability to sleep, which then has follow-on effects because when you're not getting enough sleep, that further fuels uh, conditions like anxiety and depression. And so that, you know, tying that back to uh, the thing you were talking about in terms of that uh, oddness or that tension in that the sales conversations over a snowmobile, I think I, I, I see that in so many different interactions throughout society, both on the personal level and kind of on the larger scale. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I can agree more. And you, you forget because it's been so long, like year three. <laughs> and I feel like people are waiting for things to go back to normal. But then I also feel like this is, this is normal. Like this is life and we have to adapt to it. And I feel like we have to learn to be, okay with maybe more technology but also being a human being and being compassionate and not so robotic just because we're using all these pieces of electronic that i feel like probably represent less human interaction than they do yeah no i i agree yeah i mean what one one thing about um so we we spent the first six months of the pandemic i i, I mentioned you know when it hit we had the choice to either stay in Panama or return to the United States, and we opted for Panama. Um, Panama, at the time, it, it, it had one of the strictest lockdowns in the world. Um, now, other countries have, you know, some parts of other countries have caught up on that, including Australia. <laughs> um, but Panama, so um, we were uh locked in our apartment basically all week we were allowed outside of the apartment uh, twice a week for two hours but we were not allowed outside of the apartment at the same time because we were you know, obviously uh, we are <laughs> different genders and it was a gender-based system so i was allowed out on tuesdays and thursdays and she was allowed out on mondays wednesdays and fridays oh and it, and and you know as we were going through it you know, we're also watching news from around the world and we think, wow, this, the, this is, everything is crazy. I'm glad we're here. Uh, even, and fortunately we had a balcony, so we, we could at least get air. Um, but now in retrospect, I look back on that. And it's like, can, can you imagine being locked in an apartment with just pick a, pick your favorite person in the world, you know, that, <laughs> and you're locked in an apartment with that person for six months. Um, I mean, that's kind of like space station, international space station level kind of <laughs> situation where, you know, and, and it, it, the, the amount of stress that we must have dealt with and internalized in that period, uh, you know, it must be astronomical. But at the time, you know, we were just and, and, and for me, work was uh, going quite well at that point. So uh, I just channeled everything into work. I was working. Uh, 70, 80 hours a week at that point, um, since I had nothing else to do. It was either that or Netflix. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you think back on it, well, like the, what, what must have that, what must that have done? Um, but I mean, right now I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. I don't feel like I have the hangover effect of, of that experience, but, but you know, it, it had to have impacted me. Right. And we don't know what, how much damage that that has done to individuals and we're fortunate to be motivated for our work and our job. Like we did the same thing. Like we locked ourselves in the basement and like, all right, if we're not doing anything, <laughs> may as well make some new products. We made a dozen products in six months, you know? So yeah, <laughs> that, I mean, at least we could, we could channel that energy somewhere. And some people were just basically losing their minds, you know, over, you know, technology or staring at a screen or, or whatever it was, no human interaction. And then you think even a couple of years later, we're, we're still dealing with that. And how long is that going to take for people to get back to, you know, if you can get back to what you know, how you were before? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you can. I, yeah, I don't think you go back to how it was before, but I think, I mean, you don't keep going the way it's been going either. I, there, there's uh, the new, the, uh, a term like the new normal is, is pretty fraught. So let's not use that. But, you know, there's 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 kind of a, a balance to be. I mean, like right now in Panama, 
uh, the we're getting the Omicron surge. Um, so we're, you know, a couple of months, I guess, behind North America on that. So it's really hitting here. And I mean, the number of cases, daily cases is up about a hundred fold in the last six weeks. Um, but even given that, you know, like I said, this was a country where it had some of the, the strictest lockdowns in the world. This time around, everyone's like, no way, you know, and they <laughs> were just, you know, uh, just uh, no Going one's outside. doing quarantines. No. Yeah. Everyone's. You know, they, I mean, they, here there's a mask law and that hasn't gone away. So everyone has to wear a mask out in public unless you're sitting down at a restaurant uh, where you can take it off. So and people don't get upset about masks here. Um, but, uh, but other than that, yeah, they're, it's like, there's, they're not shutting things down. Uh, they're not putting on curfews or quarantines. And like I say, the surge, at least in terms of infections, it's the highest of the entire pandemic right now. Um, but the reaction is, is entirely different. And I think that's what, that's, that's kind of how it's going to go from, from here on out. Right. So tell me, tell us about EMF. <laughs> tell us about all the damage people have just been dealing with locked in their houses <laughs> so i mean yeah what i mean as, as you know i know a lot about that subject is there <laughs> something in uh in, in some aspect of it you wanted to uh, get into here yeah well i'm interested in the business aspect and then how people can help help learn live a bit healthier and uh maybe avoid sure. some of that okay some of that damage that okay. occurs so the thing with emf yeah so the thing with emf and for those who don't know or who didn't listen to uh our chat on on the last time i was on on your show uh stands for electromagnetic field it's a form of energy made up of electricity and magnetism uh so it's a form of energy and there's a form that all of you are familiar with and that's visible light um, so the light from the sun is a type of emf and for the va for almost the uh, complete entirety of human history and the history of life on Earth, that was essentially the only form of EMF to which we were exposed. That plus the Earth's own magnetic field. Then uh, there are other forms of EMF. So they exist on this thing uh, called we call a spectrum. Just like the rainbow is a spectrum, the rainbow is actually a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So there are certain forms of EMF with more energy than sunlight, and we call those ionizing, and they include things like x-rays and gamma rays, and they are very, very, very dangerous, even in very, very, very small doses, and that is universally accepted. That's why uh, when you get an x-ray at the dentist, they put a lead coat on you, and they actually leave the room to get as far away as possible. What? But we... Yeah, but, so but, it's still... You're still getting it in your head, but you need to get it in the head because for the x-ray to work it has to go to your head but the, by putting on the lead coat they're minimizing the other the, your exposures in your other part of your body and yes they go away because they are doing this over and over and over again right um and so the repeated exposures would be but even even with those precautions you're supposed to get as few x-rays as possible and when i go to a dentist if they try to give me an x-ray i ask them why um, is it just because it's been a year? Because if it's just, if it's just because it's just been a year, I'm not gonna just get my, my head x-rayed. Um, but again, this is totally non-controversial stuff. There's no one out there saying x-rays are safe, get more of them. Um, <laughs> because everyone knows those forms of EMF are super harmful. So then on the, with the, there's forms of EMF with less energy than sunlight. Those are called non-ionizing. And those come from everything that communicates wirelessly and everything that runs on electricity. So that includes cell phones and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. It includes power lines and refrigerators and uh, blenders. Everything that communicates wirelessly or that runs on electricity is a source of this type of EMF. And it can be easy to ignore because it's odorless, it's invisible, it's tasteless. Uh, and it can also be you can also kind of be lulled into thinking, well, it's everywhere, must have always been everywhere. And the, the fact is that it hasn't, right? Because until the mid-19th century, until the invention of the light bulb, there was no human-made EMF on the planet. So, again, for the vast, vast, vast majority of, of human history and the history of life on Earth, there was no human-made EMF. But since the invention of the light bulb, you have more and more and more and more of it every year. Traditional scientific thinking 
was that this stuff was benign, that it was harmless. And uh, that what, what science has shown in, in it, I mean, really, the science on this goes back about 100 years at this point, but it, particularly in the last few decades, is what it has shown is that th th that assumption was false, that the assumption that non-ionizing forms of EMF is safe or benign is false, that it does harm human life as well as all forms of life because of the particular mechanisms that, that we, we can talk about separately. But because it, it impacts us, for instance, at the cellular level, it impacts DNA, it impacts uh, the flow of energy uh, in living things, it impacts all living things. So this, again, this stuff comes from uh, laptops, it comes from cell phones, it comes from your smart TV, it comes from, and if you sit down and think about it, and you think about today, you know, what are all these sources in my environment? And then you think back to when you were a kid, what were all the sources in your environment? And you can start to see in your head just how much this stuff has grown. Because uh, when I was growing up, right, we didn't certainly didn't have cell phones. Uh, they weren't even invented until after I was born. Uh, certainly didn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, didn't have a cordless phone in the house. We did it at one point, but not when I was really young. Uh, we didn't have smart TVs. We didn't have cell towers nearby. Uh, we didn't have Alexa speakers. Uh, I didn't have an iPad, right? I, so w when you start to realize what's in your room or in your home right now, and you think back to when you were growing up, you start to, you, you start to be able to see just how much this has grown. And it continues to grow every, every year. That's exactly why technologies like 5G are being introduced, because a 4G network does not have the capacity to connect enough devices that are being deployed into the world around us. The health effects that are linked to EMF exposure are very wide, very varied. So at the, uh, at the let's say, the lower end or the, the less concerning end, but still concerning, right, you have issues of anxiety. You have issues of uh, sleep disruption. As you go up the scale, you can see issues of infertility. As you go up the st a scale further, you have issues of miscarriage and birth defects. As you go up the scale even further, you have the, uh, the diseases that get the most attention in the media, which are cancers, including and particularly brain tumors. So the science uh, linking EMF exposure to all of these conditions is large. It is continuing to grow. And so that is for uh, that is to answer your question, I, I guess, the EMF issue, right? We are surrounded by technology that emits this stuff. This stuff is harmful to human health. And the science showing that is significant. And it is it is very compelling body of research at this point. It's thousands, literally thousands of studies. So what can you do? Because this stuff forms the Com the, 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 the complete uh, infrastructure and underpinning of modern society. So you can't get rid of EMF, right? It's not like with tobacco smoke, uh, where you could regulate tobacco out of existence tomorrow. No one would ever get lung cancer or emphysema again from smoking. Uh, and that would be basically fine. I mean, I'm not saying that's uh, a, a, what government should do. There's issues of human freedom. I'm just talking in practical terms. If tobacco was banned tomorrow, things would be fine. If EMF was banned tomorrow, <laughs> right, not only would you and I not be able to talk right now, not only would you not be able to watch Netflix tonight uh, and catch up on Squid Game or whatever, uh, you wouldn't be able to read a book at night without a candle. You would not be able to refrigerate the meat that you got uh, from the supermarket. In fact, the supermarket wouldn't be able to refrigerate it in order to sell it to you, right? You wouldn't be able to call for an ambulance when you, you got sick or there was a big emergency, right? It, everything that defines modern society is a source of this stuff. So you can't get rid of it. So that's where uh, the work that, uh, that I do comes into play, which is how can you be exposed to less of it? Because that's really the game we're playing here, right? You can't eliminate your exposure to this stuff, but you can reduce your exposure to this stuff, and you can work to eliminate the worst exposures to this stuff. So a lot of what I... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go, go for it. Yeah, before we get into some of those benefits or, or what you can do about that, 
I'm wondering what you think uh, about people like we know that at least some people have heard about this as an issue or spending too much time in front of technology. Mm -hmm. Why do you think people don't care? They don't really do much about it. They don't limit their exposure. It's constant, 100% from when you wake up, often in the middle of the night till when you wake up in the morning. Yeah. So that is a complicated uh, there's, well, let's say there's multiple answers to that question. Um, so one, like I mentioned, EMF, it's invisible, it's odorless, it's tasteless. You can't touch it. It's very, very easy to not even know it's there uh, unless you've heard about it. Um, because uh, so, so right off the bat, it's just easy to ignore. I guarantee you if EMF looked like tobacco smoke, the discussion would be different. Second, this stuff comes from all of these experiences uh, that we love or have just completely come to rely on. So that includes our phones, to, which many of us enjoy and many of us are actually addicted to, which, I mean, it, I don't use that term lightly. This is a term that is in use in research and academia and uh, tech addiction, smartphone addiction. This is a real thing. So there are people who just love it. There's people who are actually addicted to it, which means that you are averse to learning anything bad about what that could be doing to you. You have the fact that the science uh, has been polluted. So while there is a box that shows that this stuff is bioactive, that there are negative harmful effects, you have other uh, research, uh, much of which has been commissioned by companies like the wireless companies or the power companies showing that this stuff isn't harmful or isn't as harmful. So, and this is part of the tobacco playbook. That's the same thing that the, the tobacco companies did back in the 50s and 60s. So then what they do is they muddy the science to complicate and confuse the debate. Um, and then you have the fact that, you know, how would I, in today's day and age, how would I get the message out? I would get the message out using technologies <laughs> that are owned by companies that profit from they don't profit from emf exposure they profit from things that require emf exposure so facebook doesn't profit by exposing you to emf but they profit by showing you ads they can't show you ads unless you're exposed to emf uh, google profits not from exposing you to emf they profit from showing you ads that require you can't get that ad unless you're being exposed to emf amazon Amazon doesn't profit by exposing you to EMF. Amazon profits by you shopping on their website, which you can't do without being exposed to EMF. So the, these mega platforms that control the communication flow right now are ones that are implicitly averse to this messaging because this messaging would suggest that you use their products less. And so these are just some of the reasons why more people aren't yet aware of this issue and even if you are aware of this issue it is easier to ignore um and so that would be my answer to your question so are there benefits to is there benefits to certain types of light so let me say let me take a step back i heard about red light therapy for example mm -hmm. is that a different and is that EMF or is that different a different type yeah of it is EMF um i don't know that much about that particular type of therapy. Um, another one I know of, but again, don't know that much about it, are these SAD lamps, uh, seasonal affective disorder lamps. Yep. Um, again, I, that is a form of EMF. I don't know that much about it. I do know that EMF is used therapeutically. So uh, one of these, and, and, and you as an athlete might know about this, TENS machines. Uh, they're called TENS, T-E-N-S. Yeah. And and they use, uh, again, very regulated, very precise doses of magnetic fields to, um, to address uh, muscle stress and to re relieve pain. And uh, again, particularly for higher performance athletes. And right. that's just one example. There's many other forms. So EMF uh, used in properly regulated doses for particular reasons um, can be uh, ben medicinally beneficial, can be therapeutically beneficial. Also, the red light that you're talking about is a form of visible light. Visible light is the, is the particular type of light to which we were all 
exposed. Well, I mean, not we were, uh, I mean, humanity was all exposed throughout the course of our evolution. So that particular form of EMF, visible light, is one that does not do the same type and level of damage to us as right. these human-made forms that we did not evolve around. What about, I heard about, is it NIF or NIA type of lighting? Have you heard of that? No. I don't know that, that one. I just may have just made that up. <laughs> pop quiz hot shot yeah okay. <laughs> i thought it was similar to red light therapy n i a or anyways i'll find it and i'll send it to you after sure <laughs> yeah okay so let's get into some of the things that you do to help people prevent all this damage that's happening sure well so the biggest changes that people can make are ones that involve their personal relationship with technology so this comes down to what I call the two rules of EMF protection. One is minimize, and number rule number two is maximize. So with minimize, you want to minimize your use of EMF-emitting technology, which is all technology. And two is to maximize the distance between your body and that technology when it's in use. So it can be tempting to think, you know, once you start to become aware of this issue, once you start to listen to people like me, this stuff is all around us. What can I do? It's hopeless. It's not hopeless because you can, with, even with all of this EMF out in the world, it is often what you do with the technology closest to you that can really determine what your cumulative, the, what your cumulative exposures are, right? So you can't shut down the cell towers that are uh, half a mile and a mile away from you. You can't shut down your neighbor's Wi-Fi, but you are in control of the phone, your phone, and your, maybe your family's phones. You are in control of the Wi-Fi in your house. Uh, you are in control of whether you purchase a pair of AirPods or just go with like you're using, and I applaud you, wired wired headset. Thank you. Right? <laughs> so um, that, that that is where you focus. So when I say minimize your use, I'm talking about not using this stuff when you don't need to. Uh, a great example of that, one that, by the way, makes a huge difference uh, for a lot of people that I, I talk to, because this is one of my top tips, is turning off your Wi-Fi at night. Ideally, you would get rid of the Wi-Fi from your house and switch to Ethernet. But I'm also a realist, and I also deal with real-life customers all the time. I know most people aren't willing to go to that ex uh, extent to reduce the EMF. But you can turn off your Wi-Fi router at night. Why? Because you're, not, you're getting the exposure from that device all night long, but you're not using it. Right. So why get the exposure from that thing when you're not even using it? So turning off your Wi-Fi at night is a great way of minimizing your use. Another great way to minimize your use is to not buy smart tech devices that you don't need. Now, I, again, I am a I, well, you know, I, I had a long career in 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 software and high tech. I see a lot of value. I am not in high tech. I am not a Luddite by any stretch. Uh, but I also recognize that there are a lot of people just mindlessly buying smart devices because they think it's, you know, they should. They, like, there's a smart fridge out. I, I need a smart fridge. There's a smart kitty litter box. I need a smart kitty litter box. <laughs> there's literally a smart tampon on the market. And <laughs> you, you, they're, they're making everything smart. Uh, but the thing is, with each one of those smart devices, you're adding more and more EMF into your environment, often your home environment, where you and your family spend so much time. So when one of these smart devices comes out, you think, like, do I really need this to be smart, this X, this whatever product I'm talking about? One example that I give that that I think is particularly useless is smart fridges, uh, because I personally don't see any value to be had in that at all. Uh, and, um, but the, the point being you, with any new tech that you're evaluating buying, think about, do I really need this? Because once I buy it, it's going to be on and a new source of EMF in my home. And does it really give me the value and enjoyment that justifies that continuous exposure? So those are examples of minimizing. Now, here's why the second rule you'll recall is maximizing. The reason maximizing distance matters so much is because the power of EMF radiation diminishes exponentially with distance. So that means every time you double the distance between your body and the EMF source, you're cutting the power of that exposure by 75%. So this goes back to the point I was trying to make, where which was it, it really matters what you do with the tech 
in your own life, in your own household, because you, the, the exposures from those devices can be much, much greater than from a cell phone tower that's a half mile away or even just down the block. I mean, it all depends on, on, on a lot of it. But the point being, the closer this stuff is to you, the more power of the exposure. So those are the ones that you can control and those are the ones that you should do something about. So what do I mean by maximizing the distance? What are examples there? Well, never carry your phone in your pocket or in your bra. This is something that a lot of people do. It's a really bad habit. In fact, if you read the iPhone manual, you'll see that Apple tells you not to do that <laughs> but no one reads the manual um, because when the phone is in your pocket or in your bra, you are getting an extended dose of the full power that that device has to to uh, to transmit. Right. Because it's right up against your body and generally for extended periods of time, like when you're walking around all day or when you're working out at the gym, you're talking about 40 minutes an hour, two hours, five hours. And that these exposures are very, very significant. Uh, so never carry your phone in your pocket or in your bra. Never use your laptop on your lap. Never hold a phone up to your head to make a call. Always use speakerphone or a wired headset. So these are examples of ways that you can maximize distance. So remember, minimizing your use and maximizing your distance, those two rules can make a huge impact on your personal exposure, even as you can't turn off your neighbor's Wi-Fi and you can't shut down the cell phone towers that are outside your window. You still have a lot of control and you can do so in a way that doesn't negatively impact your ability to enjoy and benefit from modern technology, right? I didn't say give up your phone. I didn't say get rid of Wi-Fi. I didn't say don't use computers. You could also move to an island like Panama. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're in Isthmus, but yeah, I, I take your point. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what I think about is that when we get away, like like everybody says that you get away, we're fortunate here, we're close to the mountains, you get away from the mountains, you go for a walk through the, um, you go through, through a, a walk through the woods or wherever it is. In most cases, you're away from technology and everybody feels better. Everyone feels refreshed yeah. and ready to go, but no one, accum or relates that to not just getting away from work or your home life, but all the like, being constantly surrounded by all these uh, pieces of technology that's emitting EMF, what you're yeah. talking about here. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's not just that because right? it's EMF comes from these experiences, right? EMF comes as a, it's a, in that sense, it's a byproduct of using Facebook or scrolling on Instagram, or watching TikTok, or shopping on Amazon. It's a byproduct of these experiences. Um, but those experiences themselves, and the uh, amount in, uh, uh, that we interact with them, those also have mental and physical impact on our health. And so it can be difficult to actually tease out um, when it comes to some of these issues like anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, uh, rage control issues. It can be difficult to tease out what's actually coming from the EMF versus what's coming from that, you know, prick on Facebook who won't shut up in my <laughs> comment thread, right? Or whatever it is. And, yeah. and, but when you detox, um, you are breaking away from all of it, right? So, so the benefits that are, that are had are real and they are tangible and they come from both um, uh, detoxing from EMF exposure and also detoxing from these toxic experiences. And, um, that's actually, that, that's basically the, the whole theme of season two of my podcast, the, uh, the healthier tech podcast. It's all about disconnecting and detoxing and the, the impact that it can have on your mind and body. What do you think about ions? So I read that technology gives off positive ions and then there's things like i don't know if they're plants in particular i've read uh, himalayan salt lamps or even if you go to places like the beach where there's or there's places where there's waterfalls those give off negative ions to help balance out is that completely different from what you're talking about no it's not complete i mean it's well, let's just say I talk about this as well. So I don't know if it's completely different or just related or what. But what you're talking about is the practice of grounding, 
or also called earthing, which is a way of discharging uh, positive ion buildup uh, from your body. And this is also based on real science. And this is also the, the value of the practice is grounded in science, not to have a bad pun, is grounded in science. So grounding is a real thing. Again, also sometimes called earthing. Now, there's some people who try to do this at home, right? So they'll buy like a grounding mouse pad. And then what you do is you plug it into the wall, into the ground in your wall. And that is a more complicated issue. So I, without going into more detail on that, I would advise people not not to engage in that practice. Um, and, and, um, and, and again, the, you know, that's a deeper conversation. So just for simplicity, I'm going to suggest don't do that. So what can you do? Uh, what exactly what you just talked about, go to one of these places like, um, a beach is a great one. Uh, a park depend, you know, depending on where you live can be a great one. The forest is a fantastic one and then connect with the ground itself without anything in between, meaning barefoot. Um, and, and you will, you, you might not re realize why you're feeling better, um, but you will feel better from that experience. And it is a process of detoxifying your body from the positive ion accumulation, um, which is uh, a byproduct of, of modern life. And so again, that is not a, I just want to emphasize for people, everything I talk about is based in real science. So I, I know some of the things I say can sound a little hippy dippy and that no, no shame to the hip hippies, but that's not what I'm saying that what I am saying is science says this stuff actually is, is valid and beneficial. So with the grounding, is that, does it have to be on grass or dirt or can it be on a rock or water? Oh, on rock. Well, so yes. It, so I, rock is a good one. I don't know the answer to rock. It can be on earth. It can be on grass. It can be on sand. It can be on water. Um, I don't know the answer to rock. Uh, I, I, offhand, I should I I'll look you. that up. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the, the key is you want, I mean, if you're in New York and all you have is Central Park, then go to Central Park. But ideally you want a place with as little ground current as possible, right? So the further you are away from a dense population, the more beneficial this practice will be for you. And when I say ground current, I'm talking about literally electrical current that's running through the ground. That is that is a byproduct of modern uh, electrical grids. Okay, so I think about, and I don't know if I thought about this before our last interview. <laughs> so thanks for the added stress in my life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, that's my job, man. <laughs> but, I, but you sit there with the phone in your hand and I'm and 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 now I'm conscious of like what is happening to my hand <laughs> while this piece of technology is in my hand. Mm -hmm. What what's happening? Is there is there negative health things happening because I'm holding this piece? Well, of you are getting EMF exposure from that experience. You're getting it at a. Um, I mean, a hand is an important thing, but it's also on the whole scale of like parts of your body that you care about long-term damage to that is that is kind of lower on the scale right <laughs> and when i say that i'm talking about comparing your hand to your brain or to your heart or to your kidney or liver um everything like that is is kind of in the head and torso area so at least when it's in your hand the more vulnerable and important parts of your body are further away from it um emf does it i mean your body it can conduct this stuff so it, it doesn't necessarily get localized at the hand but the highest exposures will be in your hand yes that is that is correct um i wouldn't particularly i mean in terms of what science has to say about that right i mean what are you going to do you're going to put a hundred people in a lab and have 50 of them hold a phone for 10 years and 50 of them not hold a phone for 10 years right <laughs> so that's where you get up against some of the limitations of of what science can show, right? Because you can, in a lab, you can show that EMF had a certain kind of impact on a cell, or it had a certain kind of impact on a rat or some other type of lab animal. But when it comes to studying the incidence of disease in humans, you can't study that in a lab. Because like I said, you can't just stick a bunch of humans in a lab, give some of them a phone and some of them not a phone and keep them there for a decade or two and see what diseases form. <laughs> um, that it's impractical and it's immoral. So at that point, you're going out into society, right? And evaluating the incidence of disease in society, that's called epidemiology. In order for epidemiology to work, 
you need an unexposed population, right? You need to compare like the people who are using the phones. How does the incidence of disease compare to those who aren't using the phones? The problem there is who today is not <laughs> using phones. The Amish. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's well, it's true. And they have a much lower incidence of a wide range of what are broadly called diseases of civilization, uh, which include many that are linked to EMF exposure. But of course, the Amish also have multiple other differences in their lifestyle from not just it's not like they're just like you but without a phone right. like there's a lot of other differences <laughs> yeah. so the point being there's challenge when when the the source of the toxin is so ubiquitous epidemiology uh which is how you would normally approach a, a, a problem like the one you just said it fails and so we are limited in our ability to understand the damage that this technology is doing by sheer force of how popular and ubiquitous this technology is. Right. So did it, have they actually put a phone in like a rat's cage and seen any damage? Are you aware of any oh, studies yeah. like that? Yeah, there was a big one uh, that was released in, in 2018. Um, and this was, a, I forget, a 20 million or something on that scale budget. Uh, so it was a really big study. It's from the U.S. National Toxicology Program which is a preeminent research institute in the United States. I believe it's part of the CDC. Um, and they did a, like I say, big budget, large scale rat uh, study on rats. And they found definitive uh, increase in can cancer occurrence in the exposed population. And there's multiple other studies. That was a really big one, though, and a pretty recent for 2018. So that is an example of studies on rats that show this. Well, at least what I consider to be one of the most important sets of studies in this arena was done in the early 90s. It was on cordless phones, but very, very similar to cell phones. And that was also done on rat cells. And that is the original body of work that has since been replicated many times, but by doctors Lai and Singh, showing that exposure even brief exposure to cordless phone radiation breaks DNA in your cells. So that's another example of, of research that was done on, on rats and rat cells. So for you as a business, I'd like to know more about your business. Like I know that I understand sure. the information you're sharing. I understand you have some products, but are people more interested in this type of information? Because I feel like there's maybe a split. Like, I feel like you have the people that are a bit more health conscious, but then you have the people that are like more technology or newer phones. Like you have people lining up outside of stores when a new Apple phone is released. So it's, it feels like an interesting dynamic of people that are more conscious and may want to learn more. And other people are like, I don't care. Give me more technology. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, you're totally right. Uh, the people who... How do I say this? So for years, awareness of EMF as a health issue um, has been niche, but it has been growing. Uh, but it's still quite small when you compare it to just the market for iPhones, right? I mean, the number of people who want an iPhone is way bigger than the number of people who care about EMF uh, still. That said, I feel like we have reached a sort of tipping point in public perception. And, and let me step back a second and, and, and kind of explain what I mean. So for uh, decades, it has been the case that technology has had this kind of halo around it. Not, not unlike yours, except not green, <laughs> uh, more, you know, white or angelic yellow. Uh, but no, seriously, that technology was answering a problem. If technology, if there was a new technology to do something, it was cool. It was probably helpful. Let's dive in and let's use it. And there was no thought given to the potential downside of it. And this is not a criticism. I mean, I was a part of this generation, too, um, where, oh, the web is coming out. The web will be amazing. You know, Wi-Fi is coming. The Wi-Fi, it's, oh, my God, because I was running an office back when Wi-Fi came out. I was like, oh, my, this really simplifies my ability to set up a network, right? All of these innovations, uh, Facebook came out. People loved Facebook. Uh, oh, I can connect with all these people I lost touch with. There, and, and, and that was it, right? You'd stop it. You'd, you'd evaluate the benefit. You'd see the benefit and you dive into the technology. And there was never a thought given to what is the downside of this. Why do I say this now? Because I believe that there has been a tipping point reached where society is starting to see that technology 
can impact, it can, can have negative impacts on our lifestyles, on our lives, on our health. And it's not just the EMF issue. In fact, most people don't even, even me, most people who aren't aware of the EMF issue can be aware of this, right? Because you see it covered in the news that using Instagram can increase uh, incidence of suicidal ideation in teenage girls. Uh, the rate at which we're buying phones is filling up landfills with all these toxic, heavy uh, uh, metals that are used in things like lithium ion batteries. You are seeing it in uh, the World Health Organization recognizes video game, uh, video game addiction as a disorder, right? There's more and more people are realizing that technology can has the potential for human harm in a way that has never been the case before. So, yes, tons of people, and I have no illusions about this, tons and tons of people uh, love their technology, and that hasn't changed. But even among a good portion of those people, there's at least an awareness that it's not all good, right? That I, you know, I should, I should, I should close up, you know, I, I should load up the screen time app that came with my phone and just track how much I'm, oh, I should maybe use Facebook a little bit less. I should maybe do X, Y, or Z because they're realizing that it is impacting their, their mental state, uh, possibly their health and other aspects of their life in a negative way. And that is something that I believe is quite recent. So so the, the awareness of EMF as a health issue has definitely been increasing consistently over time, but it's only more recently that the broader population that doesn't know anything about EMF has become more aware that technology has the potential for uh, harming uh, themselves and society. And that's, I think, where we are at right now, which makes people much more open to learning more about what those harms are. And then you see people, You, I often see people taking a social media break or yep. going to be gone for whatever. I don't know what they call it, a vacation or a timeout. Or, I th it, it cracks me up that it's like a public you know, like, yeah. <laughs> hey guys, I'm going to be gone. And there's so much noise that like, no one's going to know. <laughs> no <Yeah. one's> gonna <laughs> know. But at any rate, you see, you see that on a regular basis. So and so's yeah. gone for a week or so obviously that may have something to do with what you're talking about is the, maybe the I think depression it's a good example and, of it. Yeah. Right. So that could be part of the depression, comparing yourself to people type of. Mental. I gave up Facebook in 2015. Uh, which, uh, which was a fantastic time to do it because again, regardless of which political party you find yourself affiliated with in the United States, 2016, the 2016 election was a particularly awful time, I think, to be on social media in the United States. And I had just happened separate from, from the politics of it. I just decided to give up Facebook, which at the time was the only one I was using, uh, in 2015. And I started to feel the impact on my personal mental state uh, within a week, and I just never went, never went back. Um, so yeah. let me ask you this: Did you? I feel like this may not just be you, may not be you, but I feel like people say, "Oh, I'm taking a break from Facebook," but then they spend twice as much time on Instagram. And I'm yeah, like, no, that's Why not me. Take a break. <laughs> that's not me, um, because again, Facebook was the only one I used. Uh, I mean, I, I have all, accounts with all of them now because I need it for the company, um, but I, I'm not the one logging in and scrolling or posting or monitoring or anything like that. Um, I have to occasionally just for administrative purposes. But no, back at the time, I didn't even have an Instagram account. Um, or I, 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 did not, I did not replace Facebook with another social platform. <laughs> so for you, do you have uh, employees that run your other accounts is that what you're saying you have you yeah. have the accounts you just don't use them yeah so this is a constant struggle for me is because we basically run our run our business online like it's we don't have brick and mortar we have a uh, we have independent just distributors that sell our products but for us it's a lot of work online and and i do try to get away from it like we actually just recently committed to spending at least one day out in nature getting away from technology and um because That's we great. know thank you you know we know how much time we spend in front of it and i but i struggle with 
this is this is my business. This is how we feed ourselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so to, to, the more time we spend away from it, the less time there is being able to grow your business and market and and reach an audience. So that's a struggle that I that I certainly deal with. Yeah, no, I I understand that. Um, I was well. I mean, I, I just told you back in 2020 and in, into 2021, I was working seven days a week. Um, so I, I understand that, but I've also made it a point, uh, to try to at least, for instance, take weekends off. And I feel like I am better at my job as a result, even if, even if I can't, you know, get quite as much done, um, the stuff I'm doing is better. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, yeah. you definitely have to, I mean, that's a struggle. That's, that's the struggle of entrepreneurship, right? Uh, that's why so many, entre you see entrepreneurs who are sacrificing health, for their business. They're sacrificing other aspects of their quality of life for their business because the trade-off is always like, oh, well, if I work some more, maybe I'll make some more money. Right. Um, and, but you, you just, yeah, I, I'm, so I understand that. Uh, I understand that conflict really well. And, uh, I would just, you know, and I, I, I'm not saying the answer is easy, but you'll be happier. Um, if you work a little bit less. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is you, what you find is that we, like I'm a workaholic. I love to work. I'll work from when I wake up to when I go to sleep, unless I don't consciously say it's time to take a break as, as most or many entrepreneurs, but, um, completely lost my train of thought. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> going, like taking a break and stepping away. It almost, I don't mm -hmm. know if you're a, a movie fan. But I like that sea biscuit movie that with the horse, Toby. Yeah. Like, I, I, yeah, Toby Maguire. I yeah. never saw it. You never saw it? <laughs> you gotta no. watch it. I like the yeah. underdog <laughs> stories. But they, one of the things about the horse is that he's used to failing his whole life. So then, during he's running a racing or is a racehorse racing around the track, and they pull him back just mm -hmm. a bit before the finish line. And even sometimes they let they let the horse see another one starting to pass it, and then and they're pulling in the horse back, Sea Biscuit, and then. He then they let him go and he shoots off like a spring and he meets everyone. <laughs> yeah, that's a good metaphor. Yeah, you take a little time off and then you come back refreshed and you're ready to 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 finish the the final sprint there. And that's what I feel like. And and even recently here, it's I think it's just been beginning of January, um, so it hasn't been long at all. But taking a day off of and, and doing our best to separate completely from technology. Then the next day, it's, I just feel like so energized and so much more ready to go. Yeah, no, I, 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 that, 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 that's a great, I mean, that's a great anecdote for people to under, to appreciate. It really does make a difference to your quality of life and your ability to, to perform. You got to watch the movie. Do they have DVD okay. players in Panama? <laughs> I'll send it to you. <laughs> So, and I'm interested in the product end. We have a bunch of our own products. You talked earlier mm -hmm. about designing and uh, working on that end of it. Tell our audience about the type of some of the products that you have that can help with. Um... Sure. So, our catalog right now is a couple dozen products. We're always working on more. There's always plenty in the in the pipeline. But right now, publicly, we have a couple dozen products, and our products are are based on EMF shielding, right? So, if 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 your listeners go out and just type in EMF protection products into Google, you'll see kind of a a weird assortment of potential options out there. There's there's crystals, there's gems, there's pendants, there's little stickers that claim all of these things make all these kinds of claims. Um, EMF shielding is the type of product that that uh, I make. And EMF shielding is based in real universally accepted science. It goes back about 200 years to when a British scientist named Michael Faraday created the first Faraday cage. And what he showed is if you weave conductive metals into certain patterns, it will actually shield and deflect EMF radiation. And so our products are all lined with special fabric that create effectively a Faraday cage, except it's just a, it's, it's just a, a, a sheet. It's not like a whole cage that you, you put a, your, a computer in. And so these are uh, based in real science. They are also all tested at independent laboratories to, to show the efficacy. So our, all of our product claims are based on independent laboratory testing. And what they do is they deflect radiation uh, aw generally away from your body. So we have a product like the foam pouch. Uh, where you put your phone in the pouch, and then the back of the pouch 
has this fabric that I'm telling you about. So, uh, so it, but the front doesn't, right? So it can block the radio, deflect the radiation away from your body without interfering with your phone's signal or ability to communicate. That's one of my most popular products has been since I launched it in 2015. So how do you test? So they're all uh, tested. Yeah. So you commission these laboratories and they do a, what's called attenuation testing. It's a type of radiation testing where uh, you would have, and I don't have any of my props handy because uh, <laughs> no one ever asked me that question in an interview, but <laughs> I, I generally have props. Um, but let's say you have a, a radiation, uh, for simplicity, let's pretend like you have a cell phone here and an EMF meter here, except in a lab, it's not just a cell phone. It's a very expensive uh, spectrum emitter and a very, instead of a meter, it's a very expensive spectrum analyzer. But you have a source of EMF, and then you have a tool that can measure how much EMF there is. And so you take a measurement, and then you put your product in between, and you then take another measurement, and you see how much the radiation was cut by the presence of the product, like the foam pouch. So that's how these tests are performed. Um, so do yeah. you test anyone else's? Just for no, fun, or I'd imagine it's expensive to do the test. Yeah, there, yeah that would be an expensive little hobby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I mean, it's rare that you find a company like mine that has had each and every one of our products tested. Um, just some of them, some of them don't test at all. Others will test like one um, of of their whole cat. We test every. We don't launch a product unless we have laboratory testing to, on which we can support our claims because it's not cheap. Yeah, I bet. So, and where is that done? Where is that testing done in the U.S. and we have different labs. So we we've, we've worked with labs in the United States. Uh, we've worked with labs in Israel. We've worked with labs in China, um, and we also have test data on one of our products uh, actually from uh, from Germany. So we work with different labs for different products at you know at different times depending on because we, we we launch products all the time. So it depends on a, a few. A, there's a variety of factors that go into deciding where, where, and when we're going to get something tested. And you have to have it test. I imagine you could come up with it. I could say my no, sock you don't. is. Uh, no, you don't. Yeah, that's the thing. Is this um, is an, a brand is, new EMF protector? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. Their EMF protection products are completely unregulated. Um, which is, I actually have a, I have a. a a whole video on this that I, I showed a, a lot of it's, it's got I think that one has like 25,000 views on YouTube um, where I explain this kind of thing in detail why it matters so much to actually look into what EMF protection you're buying before you buy it because it's completely unregulated you have a whole bunch of products out there without any basis in demonstrable science um, certainly no lab testing to support the claims and you know people how if, if you're just coming at this because i i also know the consumer mindset consumer learns about a problem they want a solution to the problem done right except when it comes to emf if you just look for a solution to the problem you're going to be inundated with all of these um products that uh like i say they are not they are not established they're not based in demonstrable and well-established science they don't have uh, laboratory uh, science to support their claims. Um, the market, and, and this is fueled by the fact that it is it is uh, entirely unregulated. And so it's a real issue in my niche. And I fight hard to try to standardize and legitimize um, this niche because I do believe that EMF protection products are an important aspect of reducing your EMF exposure. Like I said before, you know, the, the two key rules of EMF protection, minimizing and maximizing, right? Those are vital. Those are what everyone should start doing right away. But if you're serious about really cutting your exposures, you do need some good EMF protection products in your arsenal. Um, but the problem is people are going out and buying ones that aren't good. And I'm not saying I'm the only company that makes real ones. Um, but I am saying if you actually go out and do a Google search, a lot of them will not be this type of EMF shielding product that that SYB makes. Yeah, that's what I want to look up. We're checking it. I'm checking it out right now and checking out your competition. Yeah, <laughs> let's not mention them, though, shall we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if we're looking at EMF protection products, so there's a mm -hmm. wide array of all kinds of different stuff. Yep. And I'd imagine, well, well I don't want to. I don't. <laughs> I don't want to. Well, so uh, one I get asked about a lot 
is why don't I make a little sticker that I can put on my phone that makes the phone safe? And uh, because there are companies out there that do that. They make these little stickers that you just put on your phone and uh, they say it makes your phone safe. And the the reason I don't do a product, like I, I swear, if I could do a product that you just sell a little sticker and you just put it on a phone and it makes it safe, <laughs> I would be selling that product. <laughs> um, but there, that is an example of one for which there's absolutely no science to support those claims. And in my opinion, my intuition is such that it makes no sense. Like, how could it be safe? It's still <laughs> sending and receiving these signals. Like, how is it suddenly safe? It, it, it doesn't make sense to me. But what, uh, that's, so that's a big one because I understand from the consumer perspective, how compelling a value proposition that is, right? You just buy a, a sticker. In fact, they're so cheap, you can get them in six packs very affordably. And then you just smack it on a device and boom, you're protected for the six pack. Your family's protected. Stop <laughs> worrying already. Yeah, you well, know, why I, do people I think totally that, get the appeal of that? Why do people what? think that's real? Like, I don't, like, I wouldn't believe that. Like, put a sticker on a phone. What's, like, what's that going to do? Because it's a, they're saying they'll solve your problem. And again, EMF, it, I mean, you've taken the time to, to, to learn what EMF is and how it works and how it's harmful. You know, for, for people who've just heard there's EMF, they don't know what it is or uh, how it's actually hurting you. And so they don't know enough to know that that makes no sense. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and the and the the desire to just have your problem solved i i mean i get it i totally get it. i've been that person before on you know looking for a part for my house i mean maybe not the best example but looking for a part for my house and i just why can't i find this part i just want this i just want to find it and get this purchase in this transaction in my past it's over with i don't have to think about it anymore i totally relate to that consumer I, that it's, it's very it's potentially quite harmful when it comes to an issue like emf because you'll be buying protection and you won't be protected so do, where do you guys get your products manufactured all over you have a specific uh, place we, we manufacture so we like i said we have two dozen factory uh, sorry two dozen products we have multiple factories so we have we have a factory in california we have a couple of factories in Toronto. Uh, we also have many factories in China. So it depends on the specific product and then, of course, at the specific time. Uh, because, for instance, when, when COVID broke out, you know, there were products we were having made in China that we, we switched over to Toronto. Um, so it all depends on... Uh, but but uh, it, is, it is hard to get... I, it is hard to get more of my catalog manufactured in North America. It is challenging for a small business that is making its own designs um, to find reliable manufacturing partners in North America, unfortunately. So yeah. we try, like I say, we do have some of our products made in North America, but the most of our products are made in China, which is where all, uh, almost all of our shielding material is also made in China. We have one product that's made with shielding material out of Switzerland, um, but everything else is made out of China. It's a, it's a nightmare. It really is. Like We try to source in Canada first, and then we look to North America, like we're mm -hmm. looking around the US, and it's an absolute nightmare. My gosh, Like you find it, I'm just dealing with a we produce our own products. I'm, I'm not sure if you know, but we have a yeah. number of health food products and we're always looking for new manufacturers and designing new products. And my gosh, it's an absolute nightmare. We have so few in Canada, first off, and then dealing with border issues and getting mm -hmm. products sent up from the U.S. or from overseas. Like it's it's an absolute nightmare. And, and I'm the first one to say support local and find manufacturers where you can find close. But I mean... And I'm not even just, I know it's super cheap to go overseas, but that's not just the main concern is that it's cheaper, but it's finding the people that can do a good job and want your business. And yeah, at the volume at which you're operating. Yeah. It, it's so yeah. difficult. It's, it's very it's beyond me. I feel yeah. like, I mean, of course it's a huge undertaking, but I feel like you'd need your own manufacturer. You need to design your own manufacturer just to get the service you need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At any rate, so how do we get, so what's, well, maybe tell me, um, I won't keep you too much longer, but what's your business model? Is it, or do you guys have warehouses where your products are shipped? Uh, do you do 
drop shipping yeah, so, model? No, yeah, no, we don't do drop shipping. Uh, we have warehouses um, throughout North America and Europe. And, um, and so when a customer orders uh, from the United States, Canada, UK, or EU, the order will be shipped from, so they, they don't have to, they'll get fast, affordable shipping, and they don't have to pay, even if you're outside of the United States, you don't have to pay import tariffs on your order because it's being shipped from within your region. So um, that is, uh, so we, we, we manufacture everything, we get it to our warehouses, when customers order it, it's shipped to them uh, from our warehouses. Nice. Okay, so I want to buy something. What do I do? Thank you. <laughs> well, you you just email me. Um, <laughs> but if you're one of your listeners, um, yeah, our website is at shieldyourbody.com. That's shieldyourbody, all one word, dot com. And our whole catalog is up there. Again, if, if you're shopping from the United States, of course, uh, that's where you go. But also Canada, UK, or the EU, you can just go to shieldyourbody.com. And you can buy with um, any of our products uh, that are in stock in your area uh, with fast, affordable shipping with no um, no import duties, no import delays, no customs borders, none of that. I'm looking at your website right now. And to, so tell me what product I, that I should buy or the first one that you'd recommend. Um, well, it depends, obviously, what, what you're looking to do. My favorite product is the sling bag, um, which is like a small backpack. Uh, which is it's nice stylish convenient size it can hold so it, it, I already explained how the phone pouch works it, yeah. it works the very it works the same way as the phone pouch except it's not just a phone pouch it's like I say this nice convenient stylish bag so you, it can fit a phone it can fit a phone and a tablet it can fit your Kindle it can also fit your wallet and some cards and some pens whatever you're carrying around with you so it allows you to carry more than just your phone, but while protecting you from whatever you throw, the, the radiation from whatever's in there, like I say, a phone, an e-reader, a tablet. That is my personally my favorite product. Um, also, the hard, that is a great one. That is under headsets, and that's the headset anti-radiation device. Uh, we have air tube headsets. Those are kind of a traditional style of anti-radiation headset, um, which people can find at, at, from a bunch of different sellers. Uh, we are the only company with a product like the hard. The thing with air tubes is that they, they convert the sound from wire to air, and in so doing, uh, they kind of really cut into the audio fidelity. Um, so basically, like I use air tubes, I use them for calls, I use them to listen to Drew's podcast, uh, but I don't listen to music with them uh, because the sound quality is so poor. What the hard does is the hard will filter out the cell phone radiation, but you can use any pair of headset that you like, right? So you could have your $300 Bose headsets on and use the hard. You don't need to be stuck with air tubes. So they are, the hard is a little adapter that you plug into your phone or your laptop or your tablet that will filter out the radiation before it goes up the, the headphones. So you don't need anti-radiation headphones when you use the hard. Those are two uh, great products, um, but like I said, uh, like I said, or you know, I have a couple dozen. There's a lot to browse through. It all depends what people are looking to protect themselves from. Um, if for men who are having fertility issues, uh, who are, for instance, they're they're trying to have a child, uh, the boxer briefs are a really fantastic solution. For people who are looking for protection in the bedroom um, from EMF. Uh, the bed canopy is it, it's a, it's a slightly you know it's a higher price point product because it's a lot of silver that goes into that. But the bed canopy is a pretty phenomenal uh, product uh, in terms of creating protection. So there's there we have a lot for different use cases. But the foam pouch is the most popular one. The hard is a really great and innovative one, um, and the sling bag is my personal favorite. It's the one I use the most. Uh, all of these products are backed by laboratory testing. The laboratory test data is posted on the website. Okay, so this sling bag, I'm, I'm interested in the sling bag. Is it, is it cool? Is it like a new age fanny pack? No, it's uh, not a fanny pack. Is someone going to throw things at me when I'm walking no. down the street? No. Look, you, you're, on the, you're on the sling bag page. You see, the mo look at how good the model looks. <laughs> you look just as good as the models. <laughs> she does look good. She does look yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love uh, sling bags. I love sling bags. So, um, uh, I don't think that, I mean, it doesn't, I, I mean, I know, I don't want to offend anyone who was really into fanny packs. So um, <laughs> I'll just say, I think the sling bag is a really stylish look. 
Um, and like I say, it, it, it has a lot of the benefits of a backpack, but without, without the size kind of taking up too much space. Yeah, I like it. We're doing a bit more hiking. I could throw the phone in there, not worried about getting yep. EMF radiation in my back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, I'm, I'm sold on that. I'm, I'll, I'll, I want one of those. I'll figure out how to buy it after we get off this phone call. How about okay. that? Okay. Sounds great. <laughs> All right, my man. I think that was fantastic. Thanks so much for spending so much time with me today on the show. Uh, oh, it was my pleasure, Drew. Anytime. I love being on. I love chatting with you. All right. Sounds good. All right. That's going to wrap things up for this edition of Exploring Mind and Body. Once again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for tuning in and being a part of our True Form Life community. You can always find us on facebook.com slash trueformlife. We post up there a couple times a day on our story. We're always trying to bring you more content around living a healthy lifestyle, whether that be nutrition, fitness, lifestyle, and more. We also have free challenges that we do at least once a month. So if you follow us along there, you'll be able to join maybe a plank challenge or a squat challenge, Tabata challenge, whatever it may be we'd love to have you join us we're also on instagram.com slash drew tadia again we're posting up there a couple times a day along with our story all dedicated to keeping you fit and healthy and on track our main website is trueformlife.com if you want to check out some of our products some of our services or if you just want some great content from videos to blog posts and recipes and more we got all that at trueformlife.com. Once again, thank you so much for being here. That's it. That's all I got. I'm out of here. As always, I'm your host, Drew Tadia, in health and fitness for a better world. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Exploring Mind and Body with True Form Life's Drew Tadia, fitness expert. To find out more about the show, Drew Tadia, or to listen to past shows, visit exploringmindandbody.com.